Welcome to the Colorado Protectors Podcast. Uh, this is the podcast of the, the Colorado Fraternal Police. My name is Frank Gale, uh, and I'll be the host today. And I'm talking with Mark Sears, who is the president of Royal FOP Lodge 49 on this episode. Um, today, we're going to be discussing uh, the issue of the Venezuelan gangs in Aurora, which has you know, been in the media a lot. And there's, you know, there's been lots of, uh, of, of focus and coverage on that. And I'm not sure all of it's accurate or, um, uh, or that all the information that, that should be discussed is being discussed. So we're going to talk about that. And also we're going to be discussing, you know, the consent decree uh, that's in place in Aurora. Uh, and they are the first uh, jurisdiction in Den in Colorado, rather, that that uh, has come under this since it was created um, uh, as part of the SB 217 uh, uh, effort. Um, it's, it, you know, the state attorney general pursuant to state law CRS 2431-113, um, which is the law that covers the state attorney general's authority to do this. Um, so we're going to be discussing that um, and, and learning how kind of the dynamics of that works. Uh, and also uh, the challenges of leadership uh, for a large lodge. Aurora is the largest FOP lodge in Colorado. Um, and I think you guys probably have 600 members, over 650. Yeah, I think that's, that's accurate. You know, so uh, that's, you know, and that's a big job. Um, and um, uh, before we get started, I want to uh, give a little plug to the Colorado Police Officers Foundation. Uh, the Colorado Police Officers Foundation does a lot of uh, good work on behalf of of law enforcement officers and their families and community members in the state of Colorado. Uh, we deal with issues of uh, emotional trauma and mental health counseling that we provide at no cost. Uh, and also, uh, we do things in the community to help uh, uh, youth in the community and assist in, um, in doing things that, that uh, help youth be more successful in life. Uh, we also, uh, we have a child ID program uh, that we've been running for, for three decades now. Um, and that's, that's very impactful and, um, just a lot of different things. You want to learn more about the Colorado police officers foundation, uh, just go to the website, Colorado police foundation.org. Um, you know, you can read about the work that's being done by the foundation and you can make a donation. Any donation is, is, uh, appreciated. And we ask you to support that, that effort. Uh, Mark, welcome. And thank you. Uh, thank you for agreeing to be part of uh, part of the podcast. Um, why don't we start off? You tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, like I said, my name is Mark Sears. I've been in law enforcement now a little over twenty five years. Started with Inglewood PD. Well, I was I was in the I was in the uh, Air Force as a cop for seven, and then I went to Inglewood PD for about six six and a half, and then went to Aurora, and I've been in Aurora for a little over twenty now. Um, I've had various assignments ever since then. And I would say probably about, I would say six years ago now, almost six years I've been the president. So uh, it's been a heck of a journey. Great. Yeah. I mean, I think you guys are doing great things in Aurora. Um, from what we've seen at the, at the state level of the FOP, um, you guys are an example to a lot of lodges and uh, uh, how you represent your members and uh, all the services that you provide. Certainly, uh, uh, the success that you've had in your collective bargaining negotiations, but also in just your general advocacy for your members. Um, and it's a tough place, Thank I you. think, to do that, uh, <laughs> you know, is. because you guys are in the news a lot and yeah. you've had a lot of high profile events. And, you know, um, let's just uh, let's just, you know, uh, let's just call that what it is, because that's 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 the truth about Aurora. Um, uh, you know, um, I know that. A lot of agencies in Colorado and across the country are, you know, experiencing shortages mm -hmm. and, and of officers. You know, it seems yeah. like recruiting roles are everywhere. Uh, and, you know, given uh, the circumstances in Aurora and a lot of the the, uh, the media attention that you guys have gotten, I think a lot of it's negative and shouldn't be. Um, uh, does that you think that's impacting you guys as recruitment or is, or is it just the general lack of, of interest in law enforcement? Well, I think. It, it definitely, the lack of law enforcement, the lack of interest in law enforcement certainly has an effect on it too. But I also think that some of the, the negative publicity that the Aurora Police Department has gotten also hurts us. And I, and I think, you know, every month, I think the 15th of every month, we get a report of all the, you know, how many officers were, 
we could we could have what what we're what we're builded to have mm -hmm. and then how many we do have that are actually commissioned and the last numbers i saw was on the 15th of this month and and it was i think we were down 114 cops so we're authorized yeah. 748 and we're still down a significant amount and it, and it's difficult right i i feel bad for recruiters that we have too because our our police academy is six months long mm -hmm. and then so they go in the academy for six months but then if they don't get extended in field training in the fto program it's about a year yeah. a good year before you can actually be on your own being a cop mm -hmm. right so yeah it, it's 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 a challenge and it takes six months to recruit officers i mean it does. The, re the reality is is the process of 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 applying and going through all the the testing that's a that's generally you know a four to six month process in any agency um so yeah i mean when you get behind it's hard to catch up yeah and we have i i mean i i will commend the the, the current chief that we have the new chief uh chief todd chamberlain he's been amazing he is he took he, he was getting some I, I think people kind of posed it as negative that he was out there at the trump rally and they were we had a table set up for <laughs> yeah. recruiting and i'm like good on you sir <laughs> there's a large amount of people there right and yeah. uh, and a lot of those people were were police supporters you know so uh it, it, it's difficult everywhere from the chief all the way down to the officer of trying to recruit. You know, I, years ago in my law enforcement career, I spent two years as the recruiter. And um, what I learned in that experience was go everywhere, mm -hmm. go everywhere, put information out everywhere, go to every place where you could possibly meet somebody that might be interested in coming into law enforcement and, and give them that information. Um, because you know, you, you, there, there is no one single repository where you can just show up and say, here's the place where we're going to, where we're going to get all our, all our next, all our cops next. It just doesn't work that way. Um, sometimes I saw other recruiters and they were focused on the, the post academies or they were focused on, uh, you know, junior colleges or, or four-year colleges where they had criminal justice, uh, uh, instruction going on. And that's great. And you should go to those places, but if that's the only place you're going to go, you're going to be missing a significant amount of people because there's a lot of people that sometimes are just looking for a job and they're good people and they've got a clean background and they're not, uh, you know, they're not addicted to anything. Um, and it just never really occurred to them. I used to find out it never really occurred to them that they could actually do that work. And they would think, well, I don't really think I have what it takes. And, and when you talk to them, you say, we're going to train you, we're going to teach you. And you know, you, you can be as successful as the, in this as anybody else. Right. And so um, I, I think that was probably a good move for the chief to say, let's go move. out there. Any place there's a large group of people, go out and set up a table. It was a great move. You know, yeah. so um, so one of the things that's been in the media about you guys, uh, the, 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 the issues with the, the Venezuelan gang problem and also just general uh, yeah, immigrate, immigrant crime issues, uh, that are going on in Aurora. Um, you know, you hear the stuff, it's in the media. Uh, you have p politicians talking about it as well, um, taking over apartment complexes and overrunning the city of Aurora. Yeah. Um, you know, what's your perspective? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in a, I guess, fortunate to be in the position I am, right? Not only am I the president, I'm not a full-time president, right? I, I, mm -hmm. I still have to go out and be a cop too. Yeah. And I actually am part of, I'm the sergeant for the District 2 PAR team police area representatives. So we, we deal with situations like this regularly. So the, the fact of people saying that our city is being overrun is absolutely wrong. That is not anywhere near a accurate narrative at all. Uh, do they exist? Yes, they do. They exist. So do all the other gang gang members that we have in the city of Aurora in the state of Colorado. There's just hundreds of different gangs and yeah, they exist. Um, and I think that, is there a, a criminal element that is, is, are, are at these different addresses or are these different locations? Yes, there is just like there is in every other apartment complex. Uh, are they overrunning them? No, they're not overrunning them. And actually what the net, what the media is doing is creating more of a problem. Because when there's gangs that already exist and have existed there for years, for the 20 years that I've been there, they start taking it personal. It's almost kind of like a turf war, if you will, mm. right? So they start coming in and then they start spray painting things all over the place. Like, okay. no, this is this is our place, homie. We're not yeah. we're not giving this up to TDA or any other gangsters. That's yeah. We've been here forever. 
So they go out there and they start spray painting and they start tagging all their stuff, right? And start saying who they are. So there's just not what people think it is. It's not them taking it over. What has what has transpired is that the owners of said properties that we're that we're talking about are basically slumlords. And that's exactly what they are. And I see it firsthand every day. And so my guys actually went out and conducted a bunch of different operations and put put a serious blemish on them. You know, and we were we were hitting them really hard and we were going after them. And I'll tell you what, though, all the people that we contact contacted up there, the vast majority of those, those people were really good people. Even the ones that were there that we knew were involved in shady activity, they were very respectful to us. I'd never gotten to one fight that was up there. I never had one gun that was drawn on me. We never got into any shootings. Are the shootings there? Yeah, there's shootings there. There's shootings all over the city of Aurora. But it's not to the uh, to the it's not to the narrative that everybody's trying to say that we were taken over. And then I started seeing, I started seeing a narratives coming out on like social media where they actually were using the camera coverage from Dallas or from whispering pines, which are just two of the, two of the locations where we have Venezuelans. And they were saying that it was in Chicago. And I'm like, man, that, that's, that's Aurora, Colorado. Like, what, what are we doing here? And, um, and, but they tried to push this narrative. Right. And now we have this, what I call freelancing, freelancing journalism, which is everybody that gets on their podcasts and they start creating their own stories. Yeah. Right. And then I'm going, well, I was just, that's not Chicago. That's, that's Dallas. That's, that's where, where it's Dallas street. It's not, so it, it's, it's not as, it's not what people are trying to make it out to be. This really is slumlords that aren't taking control of their property the way they should. And then there's the other narrative. Well, they did have property management there. And they got assaulted and then they left. Uh, and that's true. That That's true. It, it, it 100% is true. Mm -hmm. But it was the lack of ability that the owners have of that property to take that over and started blaming the police that we weren't doing our part. And look, we have to we have to prioritize calls for service that we have. So when we have property crimes and we're at locations, but I have, you know, an aggravated assault that's happening down the street or somewhere else in the city, as a boss, they, we have to be able to prioritize those things appropriately, mm -hmm. right? And th the fact of the matter is, is the city of Aurora is no longer Fletcher, Colorado. Yeah. It's, it's Aurora, Colorado, mm -hmm. okay? And it, it is geographically the largest city in the state. Mm -hmm. And we have over 400,000 people in that population. And when we're authorized 748 cops and you're down 114 cops, they are doing a, an a incredible job the cops are. I'm, I'm glad you said that because, um, you know, it seems to me that oftentimes, uh, and, and this is certainly true in Aurora, but I think it's true in a lot of places where uh, it, there seems to be laying blame at the doorstep of the cops for all the, all the social ills um, in our society. And, and you're either um, not doing enough to police the city or you're, or you're too aggressive and, and, and policing. Um, and the truth of the matter is it's tough work. It's a tough job. And, and the, the circumstances that officers are working under today are tougher than they've been, I think ever. In, I agree. In my opinion. I um, agree. So, you know, it's just, and it's, it's one of those things where you're working short and there's a lot of, there's a lot of things going on and you're trying to, to keep up and you're trying to deal with those things. And so, um, and you're trying to, you know, build relationships with community and you're trying, you know, to, to keep the confidence of the community high. Uh, so it's, it's, it's tough. Um, and, and, you know, I, uh, I, when I'm driving through Aurora, when, and I, I drive through it all the time. I shop there. I, I'm there a lot. You know, I see the officers and I see, you know, these are, they're, they're, they're good people and they're, they're working hard and they're, they're, I think, uh, respectful, kind, uh, and, uh, uh, considerate people that I've encountered. I've, I've, Thank I can't, I can't are. say I've ever had, I've been some other places and had some, some weird encounters with cops. I'm just, gonna, <laughs> sure. you know, and I was on the job for, for, for 28 years. So, I mean, I get it, but, um, but I, ha I can't say that about Aurora. Um, as busy as they are, cops are always, uh, courteous. Um, so, I mean, you got, you got, you know, immigrants there from, from Valen, from Venezuela, and you've got them from every place else, probably. I, what, what I've seen in Aurora is there's a lot of immigrants. It's, it's a, there's a, there's a high immigrant population there. Yeah. It's, it's a, I look at Aurora in the state of Colorado as kind of like the melting pot, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost kind of like a mini New York city. You have every 
nationality, you have every race, you have you have every every possible every possible race and any kind of ethnicity that you have. It shows up in Aurora in some place, mm-hmm. and there's pockets of them, right? There's mm-hmm. pockets of uh, of an Asian population, a Russian population, a Somalian population, a Venezuelan population, uh, Hispanic population, African American population. I mean, they're all in Aurora, and they come to Aurora, and and it is it's very unique, which also makes that city pretty awesome, in mm-hmm. my opinion. So, I mean, um, you guys having any specific or any kind of different challenges? Uh, dealing with immigrants, especially un- undocumented immigrants in Aurora? You, oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's what's so challenging about it, right, is that, you know, the current administration that we have it, it has failed when it comes to immigration. 100% hmm. has failed. Uh, Governor Polis, uh, that's a big problem. You know, you're just, you're just, he's allowing people to come in here and they're not documented. So when we go contact them, we don't know who we're talking to and we don't have any way to keep documentation of who they are to be able to see criminal activity that has occurred. So if they come into the United States in the way that it was described to me, now I'm not on the borders, okay, but this is how it was described to me. Mm -hmm. They're getting fake identification cards from whatever country they're leaving. And let's just say Venezuela, because that's what we're talking about. And they get their fake IDs. They get to whatever port they come into in the United States. HSI is there. They take a fingerprint of them and they could be Frank Gale which is on their ID. Mm -hmm. And then from there on in, when they're in the United States, if they even have one of these fake IDs, they're Frank Gale. So Mm -hmm. our technology and what, and what we're lacking is, is the ability to share information with other entities, right? Whether it's sensitive information and they don't want to tell law enforcement because they're a governmental agency, that's law enforcement and it, and it becomes very convoluted. Mm -hmm. So we have to then try to start developing our own database of exactly what we're doing. So when I take my teams out there and I start enforcing the law there, we have to take pictures of them. We have to take pictures of tattoos, pictures of their face. We have to then write down whatever name they may have on an ID or what they tell us. And we're really starting from ground zero because they're undocumented and it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it becomes a disaster trying to figure out who they are. Yeah. I mean, I can see that would be challenging anywhere. Um, and because I think you have a high immigrant population in Aurora, maybe higher than than uh, other cities in Colorado. I'm not sure if that's true. I'm or not either. Um, but there, there does seem to be a, a high number of, of immigrants in the city. Um, so, you know, the city, you, you, you talked a little bit more about a little bit earlier about the, the property owners. The city uh, has cited some of the owners of these properties uh, that, that, you know, have large immigrant populations as for tenants for not maintaining properties in a proper manner. Uh, unhealthy living conditions, um, and what's your perspective on on what's going on with with the city doing that? And should the city have cited the property owners? Well, the city should cite the property owners, and there's a ton of code violations that they have, right? And that's what a lot of people have to recognize too is is that we have the law, the criminal law that that the police officers enforce, and there's code law that we have that our code enforcement officers actually enforce. But when you start developing, you know, one of the properties that we had that was on Nome in no, on Nome Street, that place when you walked up there looked like a third world country. Mm. Okay, I mean the garbage was stacked up probably two, two stories tall, and an entire area that was wrapping around. I think it was like the south, the southeast corner of it, or the east on the east side of the building, and it was disgusting. Everywhere you walked around in there, there was just feces and urine that you could smell, and it was visibly noticeable when you would walk around there it was it was horrible inside of the apartments itself were disgusting they might have had a mattress that was laying there and you know what that might be acceptable in their country but it's not acceptable in the united states of america and i don't think anybody should have to live that way well if we're going to be the united states of america and you're going to own property there you you better have it up to the standard of the united states Mm -hmm. and what happens is is everybody that lived around that area started seeing and smelling and witnessing all the poverty that was going on in there. And it wasn't necessarily just because of Venezuelans that were there or migrants that were there. The property owners are responsible to take care of that property. And they just failed to do it. They wouldn't do it. And then they started saying that they were scared to do it. Well, there's definitely different ways that they can manage that property to be able to take control of it again. And they failed to do that. And there was talking about, you know, there was talk about, oh, they had all these rifles and people were walking around with rifles. 
look, it's not illegal in the state of Colorado for you to have a gun on your hip and walk around. As long as you're not a felon, mm -hmm. right? You can have a gun. We have open carry and, and you can certainly do that. It does it raise a level of awareness. Absolutely. It does. Mm -hmm. And it should, right? It should, but there weren't that, that property management company failed to do it. And 100%, the city has to get involved when they start seeing all of the, all of the other people in the population that are concerned and bringing this stuff forward. The city manager has to step in and he has to do something. And he did, he hundred percent did and still got, still got absolutely crucified for that. And you, you just can't make everybody happy. And that's just the way that's the simple fact. Can't make them all happy. Were any of the people complaining about this uh, actually tenants in those facilities in those buildings? Sure, there were, and and it was interesting, right? Because there's there's all these videos that are being released now, and and they start talking about various crimes that happen. Mm -hmm. And then when the police get there and we get there, they're not stupid, and and a lot of them are afraid of the police, and not because mm -hmm. it's the United States. It's just their culture. It's just the way that they were raised and how they were, and. And people don't understand that, you know, the United States population, we're pretty arrogant people, right? We, we just, yeah. we just think we are, we are the bomb, man. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I believe that I believe, I believe that we are, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're the baddest people on the planet, man. We're, yeah. we're awesome. But what we fail to do is respect other people's cultures. Mm -hmm. And I think our police officers, and I think most police officers in the state and across the country, they actually do start trying to figure out about different cultures so that they can operate more efficiently and effectively with the people that they're dealing with. And in this case, what would happen is, is that they would tell various people uh, that would go on to those properties that there were all these heinous crimes that were occurring. But when we would go up there and talk to them, they really downplayed it. And they downplayed it to like, oh, yeah, no, it's, yeah, there's some guys that are, you know, they're selling a little drugs here, or they're doing this, or there's prostitution that's going on. But nothing that ever came into the effect of, oh, these people are just getting in shootouts right in front of us. You know, they downplayed it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I can't put people in jail based on hearsay. I have to have probable cause. Yeah. I have to have evidence to believe that a crime was, that occurred. And I have to be able to have physical evidence to give me probable cause to make those arrests. Mm -hmm. And I can't just go around making arrests because people told me this happened. And then I don't even know if the person that they're saying did this crime was even on scene, right? You don't even know. So well, it's difficult. I think you, I think you bring up a good point. Um, you know, uh, during my time in the military, I served in places uh, that were, um, uh, you know, uh, underprivileged countries and underserved com communities in, in those countries. Uh, and you, you're right. People who live in those places and come from those places. And a, a lot of the, the places where I served were, was in Latin America. Uh, they they do not trust law enforcement there, and um, oftentimes for good reason. That's right. Okay, so they're on the take a lot. Yeah, and so they they don't they don't trust people that that are in the law enforcement profession or the people that are in in, in authority, uh, which is one of the reasons I think why they come here. They're looking for a better, but they but they don't understand that here, you know, officers really are trying to help, and they are. They are trying to to do something positive and 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 be protectors. So I think that's a great point that you bring up. You know, someone someone raised a, 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 an issue one time. I was having a discussion with them about uh, the the situation with the the apartment complexes and stuff. And someone says, you know, those those people who own those properties, uh, most of them they're not even they're not even in this state. They're they're that's in correct. another state. That's correct. They they specifically bought those properties so that they could. Um, attract and and um, and pander to uh, immigrants, specifically undocumented immigrants, because they knew they pay in cash and they won't complain if you don't keep the place up, uh, and that that they specifically were targeting, which I think is just another way of victimizing um, a vulnerable population. Do you do you, uh, do you think there's any you think there's any validity to that? The, the, yeah, I do, and I mean, you know, you and I and anybody else can only have an opinion about it, right? Because we're not, yeah. we're not in their shoes. Yeah. However, it, in my opinion, it, it's pretty apparent that that is exactly what it is because these property owners don't live in the state of Colorado hmm. and they're constantly using attorneys to then get with the city attorneys. And that it's, it becomes this yeah. attorney war, right? Yeah. Back and forth of what they're doing and what they're not doing. But I think that's a very valid assumption. And, 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 and it's true because when you come from a third world country 
and you live, you have a, you actually have a structure that is a solid structure at least. Yeah. And then they start acting like they would act in a third world country and they, they don't care because they're getting money, they're getting paid and they're and the property owners get the money and they get it in cash. What are they doing with their taxes? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who pays in cash anymore? I mean, I just, yeah. it's yeah. just, you just don't even have a lot of cash around. Yeah. I can't remember when I had a dollar bill in my wallet last time. Yeah. I know I, you're, you're exactly right about that. Um, somebody else said something to me and I thought, and I thought this person, I, I don't think they were that informed, but they, they made the comment, um, well, you know, the, what, what does Aurora expect? You know, they're a sanctuary city. Is Aurora a sanctuary city? No, we're not a sanctuary I city. I didn't think so. Now, you might, there might be some political figures that we have in the city that want to be a sanctuary city mm -hmm. or be a sanctuary city. We're not classified as a sanctuary city. Mm -hmm. And I would say that most of, most of our elected officials would tell you we're not a sanctuary city. And I agree with them. We're not. And so the political leadership and the management of Aurora has not declared themselves as a sanctuary. City. No, I didn't think that was the case, um, but I actually heard that. And, and believe it or not, that some of the people I heard that from were our members mm -hmm. of our of our organization. I'm thinking, and I think you're, you're wrong. That's wrong. I haven't heard that anywhere. And there will be people that will come on other podcasts or people might go into the media saying, yes, we are. Yes, we are. I have not heard that officially at all. And I'm pretty close to city management. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about some of the stuff that's been in the media. Um, I wanted to see if we could play one of the news clips um, and get you to comment on that. Um, and I think this would be a good place to do that. Um, so. It had been a while since we heard from CBZ management. This new statement coming out, they say, is being made because they want to set the record straight. A bit of a warning now. Some of the images that you'll see in this report you may find disturbing. CBZ management said it had been trying to fix problems at its apartment complexes in Aurora for a couple of years. But the company says gangs began causing problems at the end of 2023. This is surveillance video the company said shows one of its representatives being assaulted after he refused to accept a bribe at the Whispering Pines complex. We spoke to that worker today who said, I think they were trying to kill me. I don't know how I got out. But I got out, he told Fox 31 in a telephone interview. The city of Aurora has already shut down one of CBZ's complexes and is threatening to take over others, like the one on Dallas Street, where security cameras showed men carrying guns. The company said migrants were not the problem. Instead, it was gangs that had taken over the complex and management could not get help stopping them. The city told Fox 31 today some of CBZ's properties have gone into receivership. MSU assistant real estate professor Jeff Peschute explains what a receiver does. They really step into the shoes of the owner and they make ownership decisions. Again, subject to the <laughs> order of the court, but they make ownership decisions in what they view as the best interest of the property and therefore the best interest of the lender. Peshut says receiverships almost always take place before foreclosures. Today, a city of Aurora spokesman said, quote, the city was not going to give credence to these continued exaggerations. And tonight during the Aurora City Council meeting, Council Member Daniel Jarinski is going to present a proposal asking that an investigation take place as to how so many migrants went from Denver to Aurora without notice. Also, the House Keys Action Network Denver says it would like to meet with this new receiver saying that things at the apartment complexes are still unbearable. I'm Vicente Arenas, Fox 31. So, I mean, we've seen lots of these. This mm -hmm. is probably, I, I, it, in my estimation, probably maybe the 20th <laughs> news article Fair. about this that, that I'm aware of. Minimum. Um, so, um, you, 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 know, you, have, you have any response? you have any comment on that? Yeah. I. So, look at the way the media, people were saying when the guys go into the building in the Dallas building and they have guns, Right. They go in there. There's no sense of urgency. Yes, they have guns. And by the way, our our investigators ended up getting the long rifle that they had there. That was, I think we took that within seven days. We ended up having custody of that. And we already had warrants out for people and we were putting people in jail already. And the last one we had that there was 10 documented T 
TDA gang members and they were all in jail or we had warrants out for them. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I want people to do is I want them to look at that clip and don't play any sound on it. Just watch it. Because when you watch it, they go knock on the door and they have their guns. All they were doing was they were trying to go get their friends to go get into a gunfight with another gang that was outside of that. They weren't taking over the building. All right. So there's a lot of, there's a, and, and what people don't recognize is the psychological, the manipulation that the media has over you. So when you're watching something, but in the background, they have a narrative going on. Mm-hmm. They're training your mind of what to think as what you were seeing. And it it's unfortunate because most people don't look at it that way. Yeah. But cops do. Cops are, we have so many different things that are going on when we're, yeah. when we're working. We have to be able to like separate our senses, right? To be able to see what is actually occurring. So when you look at that, they the, one of the doors they booted in, that was in Whispering Pines. There was nobody in there. All the management was already gone. And they were basically, my opinion, it was like self-preservation. They boot the door in. And I think that was the guy that we actually put in jail. But um, they they boot the door, they go in there, they look around and they come out, right? And they edit this stuff and they don't, you don't get to see everything that, or what is actually behind the story of what they're doing. The poor gentleman that got assaulted, I knew of that assault. That's terrible. Yeah. And it's horrible. Oh, right? it looks and horrible. It is horrible. It's absolutely horrible. You know, and those assaults happen every single day. And I don't know, I don't know what the police response was to that. I don't even, I can't remember when it was that it happened. Uh, those things happen. They happen a lot and we need to be involved and we need to, we need to enforce that law. But to create the narrative that the media does to make this evolve into them taking it over How come we don't have any media coverage of them coming in force, right? Like you don't see when, when law enforcement officers, when we respond to a call, okay. Especially if it's a barricaded subject with one guy that is, that is armed. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, we, we come in force. We're not coming with two cops, right? Mm -hmm. We have a SWAT team in there, a dart teams in there, a PAR teams in there, patrolmen are in there. We probably have 40 or 50 cops that are there if we can. And that's because we want to take over the situation and we want to, we want to rectify that situation with mm-hmm. peace. Mm-hmm. Right. But we're armed if we have to utilize our weapons. That's right. And and these people didn't come in there with 40 or 50 people. They came walking up the stairs. One guy was on a cell phone for crying out loud. Yeah. And he's talking. Right. And then they go knock on the door and they didn't show the rest of it where they actually just open the door and you can actually mm-hmm. see that there's like a greeting that occurs. Mm-hmm. So they were trying to get their friends. So did the incidents happen? Yeah, they're on they're on film, but let's have a narrative that's accurate to it and not trying to create more turmoil. Um, obviously, there's crime going on uh, mm-hmm. in the city. There's crime going on in these in these complexes. Absolutely. Um, and this is, I think, uh, normal for uh, you know uh, any kind of urban areas, uh, and especially urban areas where you have an underserved population and they are uh, easy victims for. You know those who have nefarious uh, uh, intentions, um, and I, that's what you see, and that's what you've always seen. When, you, when you're on the job, you see that more than anything else. You know, very as sad as it is to say, poor people are more likely to be the victim of crime than rich people. That's true, and that's just the way it goes. When you when you're dealing with victims, uh, and you're on the job, the, the majority of people that you're dealing with are people that um, themselves are you know uh, disenfranchised and underserved for the most part. Um, so are you guys being instructed in Aurora to, and directed to react or respond in any different way to, to, to the Venezuelan immigrants, um, or, or an immigrants in general, or is it just the same way you deal with everything? It's the same, everything. I mean, you don't, are there different resources that we may use to a certain, a certain address, a certain place, a certain, yes, there, there hundred percent is when we do that everywhere, but it's not about migrants. We're not going to as a police department, we're not going to go, oh, well, you know, the, if Frank Gale is over here, we have to pay particular attention to him. So we're going to bring out helicopters and bears and all these, right? <laughs> no, it's ridiculous. What we yeah. do is, is we assess the call that we're going to and whatever knowledge that we have of what's happening at that call, we, we then properly deploy the resources that we need to overcome said situation. So we're not, we are not in any way, shape or form responding to calls a different way because of somebody's ethnicity or their color or their sex or their, or their sexuality, nothing. 
That's absolutely another false narrative. So, I mean, because it's being said in the media that and, and by the property owners of, of some of these properties that Aurora police have not responded appropriately um, to the problems, uh, you know, at, at these at these locations. I mean, you think it's, you, is that even fair to, for them to say that? No, it, number, I don't think it's fair, number one, because I don't have the knowledge of being a property owner other than my own personal home. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't have the knowledge of being a property owner out of state from where I live. So mm. I'm going to go in there and tell them how to run their properties. That's not my job. Yeah. Right. So I don't think it's fair because they don't know how they don't know what it is to be a cop. Mm -hmm. These city officials that we have or elected officials that we have, I wouldn't say so much our city officials, but our elected officials, they can have their opinion. I get that. And they have their constituents. They have no idea what it's like to be a cop. They have no idea yeah. the amount of uh, how we operate. Just just doing what people think is a quote unquote routine traffic stop. Nothing's routine in what we do. OK, it might be a subjective and it is subjective to say this, but maybe a lower. Um, it, it's not a, such a high high priority call where, where we know we have people with guns in it. Mm -hmm. They don't they can say that we didn't respond appropriately and they might have said that we didn't respond and that's that's potentially true or we took hours to get to that call because the call just didn't raise to a higher level of of violence that other calls are going on in the city of aurora yeah. the city of aurora is an active city yes it's very very active and i would say even it could be even more active than Denver when you start looking about looking around of just how big that that mm -hmm. that 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 the city is right. I mean, yeah. you look at the homeless population in itself because there's so many areas in Aurora that aren't even developed yet that they start homeless people are going in there and yeah. then creating crimes all around there. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's that's something that I want the media to recognize is that you, you're going to sit here and talk about ten documented gangsters, but you have thousands. Of, of undocumented homeless people, and mm -hmm. you don't think that they're not committing crimes, you're insane. They're yeah. creating more crimes than these people are. It's it's absurd. Yeah, there's a lot going on in Aurora, that's for sure. Um, and so, you know, how do you, how do you think officers are feeling about these media responses and and the, the, all, all this discussion? And, the, you know, how do you, how do you think the officers in, in, in Aurora feel about the way this is being portrayed and about the way they're being portrayed? They're frustrated. 100% they're frustrated. I, I speak to my members often and I stay in tune with them as much as I can. And as you said, I have like over 600 guys, so it's difficult yeah. for me to touch everybody. But they're frustrated in the sense of like, hey man, we're doing the best that we can here. And mm -hmm. this this narrative too, that they're scared, they're not scared. They're, they're just frustrated because we have all these other people that are saying, oh, you have to do your job this way. You have to do your job that way. You have to do your job this way. You need to stop talking and just, if you're a plumber, focus on plumbing. Okay. <laughs> if you, if, you know, I mean, and, and the thing is, is that if I have a plumbing problem, do I call a guy that fixes decks? No, I call a plumber. That's right. Okay. So all of you people that say that they're not doing their job the right way, mm -hmm. whatever, if you're not a cop, then don't tell me how to do my job yeah. because you have no idea what you're talking about. So they're frustrated. Um, they're, they're tired. They're incredibly tired because they're just working all the time and they have overtime shifts available every shift that they have. Right. And that's, that's, that's nobody's fault in the police department. All right. That that's, that's the fault. And, and we always post blame on people mm -hmm. enough with the blame. Let's just come up with solutions yep. on how to, how to overcome these problems and overcoming the problems is what chief Chamberlain's trying to do. He's like, yeah, there's going to be a rally over what, cause Donald Trump's here. Uh, uh, heck yeah. I'm going to send some guys out there and see if they want to be cops. Yeah. Right. It's fantastic idea. You know I mean? You can look at, and then it doesn't help. And it doesn't help from outside jurisdictions either. Like Wyoming, right? The mm -hmm. What was it? I can't remember who the person was, but they put the sign up. I think it was Laramie County. It might have maybe you're right. Was. I don't remember, but it was like, you know, they were trying to recruit by using signs, you know, yeah. that and they were renting space to be able to do that coming in from the airport, you mm -hmm. know, and that's genius. That's mm -hmm. a great yeah. idea, yeah. you know, so I, but they're frustrated to answer your questions. They're frustrated. They're tired. Um, but man, they keep coming back to work because they, they love serving that community and they're just great cops. They're good people. Let me ask you a question, because, I mean, you brought up the, the, the Donald Trump rally and uh, there was criticism around that for the, you know, the chief and so forth. If 
if Kamala Harris came and did a rally in Denver for something, you think the chief would put a, a, a table out there? You think he sends people out there to recruit? Hundred percent, he would. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, he would. It's, it's really just about there's a big population of people yes. out there. Okay. Yes, yes, and I, and I really want the community to take the time to get to see to see the leadership that Chief Chamberlain has. Okay, a lot of union bosses don't say what I'm about to say, but you know, for the last 28 months prior to Chief Chamberlain getting there. I had multiple chiefs, right? And I was getting interim chiefs and they were just absolutely diabolical, right? And they just screwed up so many things. And then we finally get Chief Chamberlain that comes in here that actually has solid leadership qualities. He's a solid leader. And now he, now we have a rudder on our ship to be able to get in the direction that we need to get. And he's killing it. He's giving the cops the discretion to be cops again. And man, are the cops super stoked about that. And they love it. And they're like, wait, we can do this. We can do that. We can do it. Yeah. Hey, look, you can do it. Mm -hmm. You better articulate what you did <laughs> and you better legally do it, constitutionally yeah. do it, morally and ethically get it done right. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, he it's moving forward in the direction that we're in is nothing but a big, huge, bright light for me. And it's taken a ton off of me. Uh, and for me to be able to sit there, I think he was there for the, the very first, I would say probably the second weekend he was there. My phone rang maybe twice. And normally that's just a constant ringing all the time because we didn't have a leader. And yeah. now we do. Now we do. We have a really good leader and he's got a good staff around him. Good. Is there anything else that you think, you know, officers in Aurora would want the public to know about the situation, this particular thing you know, with the gangs and the Venezuelans, the immigrants? I, I just want, I, I want the people to know and I know the officers do is that they are doing the best that they can. And when you're, when you're enforcing the law of, of a subject of this magnitude, this doesn't happen overnight where we just go up, oh, we answered this call for service and now it goes away. You've got to give this time and you've got to recognize that those cops are out there and they are busting their butts every single day and working hard, you know, and some of them get, we have shootings that occur and they go on paid administrative leave. Mm -hmm. They have their own families that they have to, you know, pay attention to as much as, and the, the residents need to recognize that the cops are people too. You know, we have all of our own stressors that you have outside of the job and yeah. they are really doing a great job. They, and I hope they can see that. Good. Great. So, you know, one of the things we want to talk about uh, also um, is uh, the consent decree that you, that's going on in Aurora. Yeah. You guys are the only uh, jurisdiction in Colorado uh, that has been impacted by this. And, it, you know, it came out of, you know, uh, the SB 2217 legislation. Uh, they gave the, uh, the state attorney general the ability to pursue civil litigation against local governments in Colorado that could lead to an establishment of a consent decree. Um, and when this happens, the consent decree is put in place. Uh, then the city has uh, involved has to comply with certain requirements, engage in activities uh, related to those requirements and compliance uh, with the consent decree. Um, the law that covers the legal authority of it is, you know, for the attorney general pr to pursue a consent decree. I said it before, CRS 24-31-113. Um, and the language in the law establishes that the attorney general must have probable cause and that there is a pattern of practice uh, a pattern or practice of an agency violating people's rights under the U.S. or state constitution. Um, and I wanted to give that. I wanted to, to say that um, so that anybody who's watching this, you know, we, we do these, these, uh, these productions, these podcasts, these episodes, uh, so that, you know, law enforcement officers and members of our organization, as well as the public, will kind of have a better understanding of what, what's going on with rank and file law enforcement officers in, in our state. Um, and so I wanted people to know that's the that's the legal authority for it to happen. And so if you have questions about that, that's where you go and review it. Um, so you guys have been working under this consent decree uh, since 20, 2021, I believe. Is that true? That sounds accurate. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like I said, Aurora is the only one I think that, that's going on. Um, you know, what, what's it like having it on a day to day basis? How does it how does it impact? The work that officers are doing on the, the coppers, um, yeah. the coppers, I don't, I don't 
really see how it's impacting them I, 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 on a professional standpoint of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Does it impact me as the president? Yeah. Cause I have to deal <laughs> with it all the time. Right. Um, however, you know, I still want to say, and I, I have to say this when you were, when you were talking about the description that there had to be probable cause for the attorney general to say that we were acting in a biased sense and we were mm -hmm. doing all this. And I, I would love to see that probable cause. Cause I haven't seen a statistical analysis that was done that proved that we were doing that, but it's here. I'm not going to sit here and blame anybody. Uh, I'll come up with solutions about it, but I still haven't seen that. I, I haven't mm -hmm. seen any probable cause that says the Aurora police department is biased in this way, this way, that way. I would say the only way that it, that it one of the ways that it impact, impacts the cops is that we have been required to do all this mandatory training, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's anti-bias training, whether it's uh, crisis intervention, crisis intervention training, um, behavioral training. Uh, I mean, just a ton of different training that we've had to do, yeah. and it and it really has put a lot of pressure on the cops because I'm not not so much of going to the going to the training and doing it well, mm -hmm. it's more so of like that, that wrapped into their everyday activities that they have to do, right? Yeah. Working, family, vacations, mm -hmm. time off, they get sick, they get, and all of that has been- There's a, just way more on the plate. It's way more on the plate for yeah. them, you know? And, you know, meeting with the consent decree monitors as I do every every month that they're in, I sit down with uh, with Jeff, who who is the the head CDM that's in there with IntegraSure. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a great relationship with him, and sometimes you know their thought processes about the way that we have to do things. I don't necessarily agree with them, right? And I think they lose perspective sometimes on just how difficult it is to be a police officer because there's not a single person on that on that team that is that is a cop. Mm -hmm. Right. They're, they, they contract some guys that used to be cops. Right. And they come in and give their, give their three, four, five cents, whatever they want to give. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't see it negatively impacting the cops of what is being instituted because they're really, Frank, there really isn't anything different than we always have done. We just didn't have it in writing. We didn't have it sitting in a directive. We didn't have it sitting in protocols or standard operating procedures. We didn't have it mm -hmm. written that way. But the cops were acting that way mm -hmm. and they were being professionals that way for as long as I've been there, for as long as I've been in law enforcement. And so now it's just resulted in some official policies That's correct. that state that this is what we're doing. That's correct. Okay. That makes sense. So, I mean, and you brought up, um, the, the, you know, the, the consent decree has a, an independent monitor, uh, you know, that's... There, I, I believe the the group is called in, Integrasure. Correct. Is it a private company? Yes. Okay. Yes. To um, my understanding, it is. Okay. I, I, I. So I reviewed the last report that they had, um, and I also reviewed um, the whole thing. Aren't they huge? Oh yeah, it was. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I read it. Uh, you know, I I read the whole thing, <laughs> um, and I read. I also read the. Uh, you know what the what the attorney general had to do was he had to file a, a civil lawsuit and a complaint with the district court, and um, some of those things uh, that he talks about in that that are, that are discussed in the in that litigation. You know, it's a it's a it's a regular lawsuit with a civil complaint. Mm -hmm. um, is there they, they lay out these things and they're saying this is our probable cause now, uh, whether that is probable cause or it isn't. Um, uh, that's the only thing I saw when I did research on this and I did a lot of research on it. Uh, that's the only thing I saw that kind of says, Hey, here's the problems. And this is what we've discovered. And this is what we've reviewed. And this is, uh, you know, what we've come up with. Um, and it, really what ends up happening is the court didn't, it wasn't like the, 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 the attorney general's office filed the, the complaint and the court reviewed it and said, you're right. All this is happening. Do it. The city said, listen, and this is one of the things that's a, a major tenet of their law. The city says, hey, listen, we can work with you on it. Let's yep. let's put together a plan and yep. we'll we'll work on it together. Yep. And that's really what happened. Correct. And so when you see the final document that came out of the court, that's what it that's what it, it, it indicates. It doesn't indicate uh, necessarily that that there was some established probable cause. Uh, the attorney general's office says this is what we think is going on. Right. 
and the city says, well, let's work together. And that's, that's really more, what I saw. That's more, that's a much more accurate description of how this transpired. Yeah. I just don't want people to think that the attorney general's office just dove into the Aurora police department and came up with all this probable cause about us being racist and biased mm-hmm. and everything else. Cause that's just not the case. Yeah. Th- that's not what I saw. Yeah. I could, when I read it, it didn't, it didn't, didn't, didn't look like that at all. It looked like the city embraced it and said, let's, let's work. Together. That's correct. So that's correct. Um, so, I mean, you guys have been working with this group and it sounds like you've had a lot of interaction with mm-hmm. them. I have, you know, I was, I was interested. Did they, did they make some outreach to the FOP or they did, did. You, or did you go to them? They came before, once they got retained, they came to the city and they met with, I would assume the big stakeholders, the major stakeholders that they identified within the city. And one of them was obviously the union, the FOP. Mm-hmm. And I was the president still when they, when they, came in and I met with, with two of them was, I think it was two of them. And we were in a conference room and we sat down and we discussed what their intention was, what they were going to do. They wanted to have my input, my feedback, great, great conversation that we had with them. And what I said to them was that, Hey, I warrant anybody or any entity to come into a police department to make it better. Yeah. And, and that's really what it boils down to. And I, and I commend, I commend the city management, specifically Mr. Bachelor of saying, Hey, who is our city manager of going, Hey, if we can be a better police department, we want to be a better police department. Mm-hmm. It's just how do cops take that? Right. Yeah. Right. It's very difficult yeah. because we can be some pretty arrogant people too. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and change is hard for all human it beings. Is. And, and it is. It and is. cops and military people find it harder to change anybody else, even though you know, change is inevitable with us and, and, and by hook or by hook, by crook, it's going to happen. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. I always say with cops too, right? Cause every call that we go on to it, it rapidly evolves and it changes constantly and your whole day changes all the time. There's constant changes, but man, when you try to change with somebody's home, you try and change yeah. what they're doing. If you tell them that you move the bathroom five feet, they lose their mind. Yeah. Right? So no, yeah, you're right. you can't have change. Right. So it's difficult, but that, that's exactly what they did. So once they came in and they met with me and uh, I'm, I know they met with a whole bunch of other entities too. And probably a lot of the council members that we have, the mayor, the city management, and then every month when they physically are here, mm-hmm. um, I meet with, with, with them and we have coffee and we discuss some of the things that have been implemented. Some of the things of like where we're at, because if you looked at that report, you probably saw these little colored balls that are on there and they're red, yellow, and green. And it's just Mm -hmm. representing where we're at trying to accomplish said task that they're talking about. And I know that the police department is doing a really good job keeping up with it. We haven't gotten everything done, Mm -hmm. but there is, that's just one report you read and it's huge. Oh yeah. Right. So it's like every quarter they're doing this with these huge, huge reports that we have. I would say if you can get, one of our one of our chiefs on your podcast about how much it's impacting them. That's that would be the the big question, right? Because yeah. it's I gotta say it, it it's actually fairly humorous to me to be in some of these meetings because there's the consent decree monitors chastising the chiefs for not doing a certain thing or not meeting the requirements that they want, and the chiefs just sit there and I'm like, how does it feel? Yeah. How does it feel? Right. Because that's, that's what they tell cops all the time. Oh, you're not doing a good enough job because you didn't do this or you didn't do that or you didn't do this. And they're the ones that are being chastised. You don't see patrolmen that mm-hmm. are in these, in these meetings, right? Because it really is up to the chief's office to, mm-hmm. to ensure that these things are happening. And they're the ones that are getting checked more than the cops are. Well, it's really all about policy. I mm-hmm. mean, the whole, the whole point of the law and, they had this. They have this law on the federal level, and they've had it for decades on the federal level. And I've seen it in other places uh, enacted on the federal level when I was on the national board of the FOP. Um, and it's the, the whole pattern of practice. It's a management issue. Mm-hmm. That, that it's described that way at the federal level. That's a management issue. This isn't really so much about rank and file officers. This is really about the way the place is managed. Um, and, and cause that's, it's all a policy perspective. And I was a boss, you know, I was a division chief, so I get that, you know, uh, policy is hard and you have to, and it is difficult. You have to constantly be, you know, be revising and, 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 and changing policy to, to keep up with, uh, any kind of, you know, new factors that, that are impacting 
uh, policing. And so I, they got a tough job, but they get paid a lot of money and they, you know, they get a lot of nice perks. And so, you know, I was a boss. And so I, mm-hmm. I get it, you know, Hey, you got to do it. And, but I tell you, I read the, the report and um, it said that you guys were, had completed about 78%. I think it's 78% of the stuff. So I think that was pretty good. And the report uh, it was put out on October the 15th. Uh, the report indicated that it was the seventh reporting period of 12 reporting periods. So, That's about so right. is there a, is, and so that looked to me like there was like the consent decree was in place for six years. So is there a, is there an end date? Do you know? Yeah, there is. And I want to say it's five that we have. So I think we hit three years in February okay. of, of this year. And then I think we have, and again, don't quote me on this, but I, I want to say it's two, two more years that we have, if not three. So five or six years. I can't remember the exact Well, it looks like it each reporting period is about six months. This one went Correct. from February to August. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I figured, well, if there's 12 total reporting periods, that would be uh, six years total. Yeah, you're probably thing. right. And and because I looked around and tried to find in all the documents, and that was a lot, it was hundreds of pages of stuff I had to read. Uh, I couldn't find where there was a specific, this is the last day of it. Yeah, I think it's kind of open ended. And, and from what I'm what I'm gathering too is is that I've never been part of a DOJ consent decree. Mm-hmm. I've never been a part of that. But from what I'm hearing, and other departments of friends that I have there, that that's a completely different animal. Yeah, that, it is. That is just like there's guys that are constantly in your roll calls. They're yeah. pulling people out, asking them questions. I know in Seattle they did, and I have a lot of friends up there, and they were like, "Oh man, it was it was a totally different beast." Yeah. So I know that this level of a consent decree is not at the same level as the Department of Justice. Yeah, no, it's not. The DOJ one really it looks it's it's way more invasive in mm-hmm. my opinion. Um, and the ones that I saw because I saw firsthand what was going on in Cincinnati and, and Pittsburgh um, when they were under them. Um, and, you know, they don't have an end date. It just keeps going until somebody says, OK, we're satisfied. Mm-hmm. Um, and they went on for years in those places. Um, so, uh, you know, we what do, what do you think the officers general impression of the consent decree thing is? I mean, what, what's their I don't think it, that it they, doesn't impact them. On a I day don't think day. it impacts them at all. I mean, it, it, they're required to do more. For instance, a, a really good example, the um, the the CDC reports that we have to do, right? The, the data cards that we have to do where you contact somebody that you're investigating and all of this information. The one problem I have with the CDMs about that was, is that they have, they have generated a, a form that we have to fill out that takes you a good 20 minutes to do. Mm, okay. Yeah. And you do a traffic stop, you got to fill one of those things out. So you have now increased by a lot, you've increased the time that mm-hmm. the officer has to take on that one interaction yeah. by at least 20 minutes, right? Yeah, which means the officer's not in service to do it. They're not, they're not yeah. in service to do it. Or they're so busy that they're like, okay, I'll do that later. And then they, they forget to do it. They forget and then, to do it. Then and then they get slapped up. for it. Yeah. They get jammed for yeah. it. Right. And it's like, God, man. And I, and I mean, everything that's on our CDC report is probably quadruple of what is the minimum standard for legislation. But that's what they chose to do, you know? Yeah. And even though I pushed back on that, there was, I just wasn't winning that fight. So, so officer, not, officers aren't running around really t- even talk about the consent decree. They don't. They, they don't even discuss it. They don't. We're in roll calls and they don't yeah. talk about the consent decree. You know, oh, this, wow. the road sergeants do a great job because they're like, hey, you know, they get the information that something probably came down from the consent decree monitor. Mm-hmm. And then they, they share that with their men and women that are getting ready to hit the road. But they don't sit there and say, well... You know, the consent decree monitor did this and said that and said that. No, they just go, hey, from now on, this is what we're doing. Yeah. And you get it done. And guess what? Cops want to be told what to do because yeah. they're going to do it. That's right. And just be a leader and go do it. I'm and s- that's what they do. They're like, aye, aye, sir. And they go. I've said that for years. Cops are led. Mm-hmm. They're, you know, they are led. And so they respond to leadership. And what they want is someone to say, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing it. And if you have questions, let me know. Have at it. Yep. That's it. And if you and, and as long as you provide them with guidance and information and direction, they'll do exactly what you tell them. That's right. That's my that was my that was my experience, um, both as an officer and completely as a agree with that. Um, so. I was one of the things I thought was interesting about the uh, the, the consent decree um, and even the reports was that there's something in there that says they got to they got to do better in recruiting. 
Yeah. It, it, which I thought amazing. was a positive. He said, hey, you guys, this is a problem, and you guys really need to focus on this. You need to do better with this. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought, well, that was at least something I thought that was um, meaningful and thoughtful because they're like, you can't do any of the things that, that need to be done in, a, in an agency if you don't have the appropriate amount of staff. And you you got to make that a priority. And I was just curious, how are they, <laughs> how are they working with the city on that? They're, our recruiters are going everywhere. I, as you were alluding to earlier, was that they are. I mean, we, we took, was this last year maybe? I think it was last year, maybe the year before. We took our recruiting division and sent them to NYPD. Hmm. And that, that was, that's unheard of, you yeah. know? So yeah. they went there. Uh, I'm sure there was discussions with NYPD about what they were doing and how they were doing it. And mm-hmm. at the time, you know, NYPD hadn't had a pay raise in forever. Right. Yep. So there was, I think seven of them that we had that ended up coming over to our department. Now, granted, what do they have? 36,000, 40,000 oh, cops, yeah. largest yeah. police department in the world. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's not like it negatively impacted them, but uh, we, they just started, going everywhere, reaching out to everybody, having different, maybe allowing other officers. When we talk about lateral officers, like getting yeah. officers from other police departments to come to us, uh, doing something, not necessarily lowering our standard, but expanding our pools a little bit more about what they're able to do and how they're able to do it. Using different techniques of actually hiring like a, a professional production company of developing videos and how we get that, how we get that sent out and who they're talking to. And also, our collective bargaining agreement mm-hmm. is huge, right? Having retiree healthcare that I yeah. got into there into it, and, and having how much, how much time off you get, you accrue. We've got, that's even bigger, right? And holiday times paying, you know, time and a half when you're there, all these, all these great things that we have to be able to have more time off or have better benefits is also a very key point in recruiting. So in some ways, that consent decree has helped prioritize some of the things that really are benefiting officers. Correct. Absolutely. You know, even and if they, you look at yeah. it that way, that that's actually the way, look, having a consent decree, everybody looks at it and says, oh my God, you guys must be terrible. You must be just a horrible individuals. You know what? Look at yourself in the mirror. Mm-hmm. And if there is, if there's an entity that is coming to say, would you like to try to get better? And you just look at it that way. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, the Aurora Police Department for the longest time was considered like the most prestigious police department in the state, mm-hmm. arguably in the country. And then you get a bunch of all this negative media that comes in and all these people that are try to make a narrative of Venezuelans taking over our city. Get out of here. <laughs> I mean, let's be realistic. Right. So yeah. it, that is an opportunity for you to for you to get to be a better unit, a better police department and serve your city more effectively and efficiently. You know, one of the other things I saw uh, that was in the report um, dealt with, uh, there was an officer involved shooting and they, they, they discussed that. Um, I don't really know anything about that particular issue it involved in, uh, uh, the shooting of a man named, uh, Killen Lewis. Mm-hmm. Um, but they also talked about, uh, and I would expect that would be in the report, any kind of an officer involved shooting. Um, they give some recommendations or they, they seem to have some trepidation about the way some of that happened. Um, but they haven't, they didn't over. They didn't outright just condemn it. They just said there's Correct. some things that need to be done, and there's some 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 issues that need to be addressed. The DA didn't file charges in the case, so they seem to to accept that. Um, but one of the things that um, I I thought was interesting is they talked about the selection of Todd Chamberlain to be the chief. Um, you know, after the exit of the interim chief uh, Heather Morris, um, and they. You know, they, they indicated that, you know, that uh, Chief Morris uh, worked well um, with them. Why, you know, with Who's the, them? The CDMs? The, the, no, wor- that Heather Morris worked well with the uh, Independent Monitor Group, <laughs> IntegraSure. They, you know, they, they say that in the report. Um, and uh, but how do you feel about she Heather didn't work well with anybody. Decree. She didn't work well with anybody. Okay. I mean, I, I'm just going to be, look, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I 100% love the Aurora police department and even the people that don't like me that are cops that are there. And I know there's many of them because they don't like decisions I make. Mm-hmm. I love them Yeah. and I can't choose my family. Yeah. Okay. That's I right. just accept them. I love them and we move on. Yeah. When she was there along with 
prior interim chief Acevedo, who she was just a, she was cut from the same cloth, right? Mm -hmm. Those two hurt our police department so bad. And she couldn't, she worked well with Integra Sure, because guess why? She couldn't make a decision. And they were making decisions for her. Mm. And she wouldn't make a decision. There was a year and a half of a pursuit policy that we were trying to get figured out. And she convoluted that thing so much that I was confused as a boss running a chase mm -hmm. on how I could actually do that. So I'm sure she did work well with Integra Sure because she just did whatever they said. She never had any kind of pushback on anything. Now, her chiefs and her administration, they had pushback and they were trying to step up, but she's the boss. She has to make the final decision. Yeah. She didn't. She just didn't do that. She wouldn't make decisions. Whereas you have Chief Chamberlain that comes into the seat and he's like, no, this is what we're doing. Boom. And we go and we move. Well, one of the things they, they, they talked about in the report was this transient chief situation where you guys have had five chiefs yeah, so in, the, in, in like the last four years or something. Um, and kind of the, the, the impact that that's had on the agency uh, and, and they seem to say, hey, this is this is one of the biggest problems yep. with Aurora, you know, getting straight is that, you know, they, they get this transient chief situation. That's right. And I thought that was interesting that they called that out. Um, but um, do you think and, and I don't know, because I didn't work there. I, I, I met Heather a few times and I talked to her. She seemed like a person who was smart, intelligent, capable, um, but I didn't work with her. So I don't know how that, you know, how that manifested itself in the management of the agency. I do know from, from my own law enforcement career, when you put persons in there and they know they're the interim, they sometimes get um, paralysis. They, they're afraid to make a decision, especially if they think they want the job permanently. They're afraid to make a decision because they think, oh, you know, if, if, I, if I make the wrong one, I won't get the job. Which I think is a mistake. You know, the reality is you got to make a decision. Correct. If you're the if you're the boss, you got to make a decision. Good, bad, or indifferent, you got to make the decision. And if it doesn't work out, you're accountable. But you know, uh, the worst thing you can do, I think, with with people that you're trying to lead is is not lead them and not give them direction. You they don't have to you know they don't have to agree with you. Right. You know. Right. I I used to say to people, listen, you know, we're going to do this. And if that doesn't work, we'll just do something else. Correct. Okay. Correct. And that's it. Cause you know, I don't have to be omnipotent, but I do gotta, I do gotta make a decision. I do gotta be responsible. You, do you think she had that kind of paralysis because she was the interim? Do you think others had that same kind of paralysis or do you think it was just part of their personality? I think is, I think it was part of her personality a hundred percent. The biggest thing was, is that she was way over her head. She was mm -hmm. way over her head and the thought processes that the, the interim chief that was there before her, like I said, she followed him everywhere. Mm. So in from Houston, all the way to Miami, all the way to here. Uh, and she was cut from that same cloth mm. and she was way over her head. She ended up, I talked with her a couple times about some incidents and she was like, well, I'm talking to him. The prior to Art Acevedo, mm -hmm. I'm talking to Art on the phone tonight. Why? You're the chief, make a decision. Yeah. And she just, and she is a very nice lady. And, and, and she just didn't have the leadership traits to lead an organization the size of Aurora PD. Yeah. And, and it just, it, it was. Terrible. And with all the challenges. And with all the challenges, come, right? come with that. Yeah. But, but everybody wants to give, you know, Mr. Bachelor, our city manager, a bunch of, a bunch of garbage about how he selected Todd Chamberlain. Look, we tried to do, he tried to do an actual selection process. And we had two finalists that were in there and the FOP, I had the opportunity to sit down with those two and give my recommendation of which one of mm -hmm. those I wanted. And those two went to public to be heard. And it was a bunch of lunatics that were screaming and yelling at them. And they both came in and said, I don't need this job. I just have a passion for law enforcement. And they both said, no, I'm not doing it. So Mr. Bachelor took it upon himself to take a different approach in trying to select this, this chief. And I think he did a great job doing it. And keeping in mind, I was still in the loop when he was, hey, these are people that I'm looking at. This is what I am. And you know what? I kept the trust that we have with each other. And I didn't say anything to anybody. Mm -hmm. I said, sir, I'm with you, man. Hey, whatever you're doing, however you're doing it. Yeah. And you got you to look at his ability too, right? He's a West Point grad. It's not like he's stupid. Yeah. You know, he, he's a very intelligent guy. Not everybody agrees with some of the things that he does. But when he looks at leadership, he knows what a good leader is. And, you know, 
so when they bring in Todd now, you're, you're, you look at that and the way he is, he knows how to decentralize his command. He's not blowing my phone up all the time. He's getting in front of the camera and he's sticking up for his cops and he's actually doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. And this is, and this is what kills me now is that now we have this rudder in the ship, right? Because all these consent decree monitors bring up that we had all these different chiefs. Yeah. And I agree with everything they say about that. And this should be, this should be a learning lesson to everybody in this country that has a police department this size. And it doesn't even have to be the size of Aurora. It could be smaller. It could be bigger. It is imperative that you have the best leader that you possibly can. Because yeah. if you don't, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. Everybody just starts crumbling. And I felt bad for the chiefs that were up in that office too, because they were like, well, let me go check with her or him or whoever the hell the chief was at that time. Yeah. Let me go check. Let me go check. Let me go check. Chief Chamberlain, he doesn't do that. He's like, hey, this is your ship. You run it. Now, if you screw up, you're I'm accountable. Sure, I'm sure he's going to hold them accountable, you're right? Accountable, yeah. You're accountable. And he's going to set it right of what he wants and mm -hmm. what he needs. But you have to trust your people. And we never had that. Yeah. We For the last, what, four or five years, we just kept ripping through chiefs. Mm -hmm. And they were all interims. And you're right. But she was set up to do to get that full-time position. It was like a trial for her. It was spring training for her. Mm. She could have gone in there and she could have really been a good solid quality leader and got things done and put it in its place and she just didn't meet that expectation. And we had to go outside. It's just the way it works. Well, I mean, obviously uh, decisions have to be made about who's going to run the agency and and um, they made that decision. Um so, I mean, one of the things that was in the report, too, that I wanted to bring up, we talked a little bit about the officer-involved shooting, um, and they, 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 made a, they made a big issue in the report about the fact that this shooting occurred at because Aurora was executing a Denver warrant. And I thought, do they not understand that <laughs> a warrant from anywhere is actionable? We got to take action. Correct. I mean, Correct. And, and I think you brought Correct. up earlier, they just don't have cops working in there, so maybe they don't understand that, but... I don't I don't know that it had that much of an impact on the report overall, but it seemed it sounded to me when I read that like, hey, they kind of just they kind of just don't know the universe. They don't. Yeah. And in that in that respect, they don't, because if I go into a different jurisdiction, we actually have policies and procedures set place. Like if you're going into another jurisdiction, even if it's a, a, a warrant of some sort, one of our yeah. warrants, I'm still calling Denver. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey man, I'm going to be in your city, picking this dude up. You want to send a patrol car over with me and mm -hmm. you know, pick this guy up. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get a cop over there. Cool. And we go over there That's and we it. do it. Right. But happens all the time. It happens all the time. No and problem. the same thing with Denver. Hey, Denver's got a warrant. What if, what if the guy, so what you're telling me is, is that if we had a warrant of, of a guy that had a, a, a warrant for homicide and mm -hmm. that warrant was out of Maine. You want me to go get Maine cops to drive all the way down to Aurora <laughs> to go take this guy into custody. Yeah. I mean, let's be realistic here. Okay. So what is the difference? I, I don't, I it, it's, it doesn't make any sense to, to me that yeah. who cares? It's a bad person. We have certified peace officers sitting right here in Aurora, Colorado. Yeah. Why wouldn't we go get them? Yeah. It just, it, to me, it, it just seemed like they didn't know the universe. And I know, in, in the neighborhood that I live in about about a year ago, a little longer than that, there was uh, a person who was wanted, and I live in Denver, but they were wanted uh, from another jurisdiction. And it was either Aurora or Thornton or something like that. And same, just like what you just described happened. And guess what? There was a shooting. Yes. A bad guy got shot. And, um, you know, but it was in Denver and they were executing the warrant for, that was, that came out of another jurisdiction. And, it just is what it is. That's, you know, that's the, that's the world. It doesn't, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't say, well, because they're not here, we're not going to execute it. Especially, you know, if it's a felony war. Or wait for them to get into your Yeah, yes, exactly. Make any sense. Um, so um, they talked about, you, you mentioned this earlier too. They also talked about the, the hiring process for the chief. Um, it indicated in the report, and, and I saw some stuff in the media as well, that there were community members who felt there was not enough community input in the process um, do you have any feelings uh, and do officers have any concerns about the way the process went? The officers, no community too bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, here yeah. again, I, I go back to what I'm talking about when, if I, if I want a plumber, I get a plumber. If I want a carpenter, I get a carpenter. I have the ability to figure out which one's the best. Okay. But you're talking about a chief of police. It, if there's a community member that has the ability to understand what makes a great chief, okay, mm -hmm. give, give your opinion. 
But the opinions that we were getting were from activists. Okay. Yeah. They were coming into city council and mm -hmm. they were acting like buffoons. All right. And they turned it into a circus. So I'm sorry if you can come in and have a legitimate educated conversation with me, I will listen to you all day. Yeah. But when you just slander people and you create this big, huge circus of a, of an event, I don't have time for that. It's not a productive conversation. Well, sometimes people have political agendas mm -hmm. and um, you'll see that and they represent themselves as, as community groups or community leaders, but they, they really have some, uh, you know, some political agenda of their own that they're trying to pursue uh, with the selection of the top person. And it's important, I think, that community members uh, do get to, you know, express themselves about mm -hmm. the, the qualities of who they think the chief should be and what kind of qualities they should have and, and, and what kind of abilities they should have. I think that's important. It is. Uh, but the, I don't, I don't know if you could please all aspects of the community. Uh, you could take them all into consideration and try to do that. I, you know, one of the things they said in the report about this, you know, the five chiefs, since the consent decree started, um, was they said, you know, the non-permanent chief created instability in the department. And so I, I don't know. I, I don't disagree with that. I think what, I think probably the city management was like, we got to get somebody in here now. It's got to be the permanent person. And we just, we just, we really need to get that done because I, I suspect even though this report came out October 15th, I suspect there had been other conversations with this uh, the independent monitor group saying this has got to get locked down. Yeah, I you know I'll tell you though the selection of Chief Chamberlain was not it was not like you know them calling him up on the phone and saying come in here. Yeah, I mean it, there was it other took, people. It took a considerable amount of time. Yeah, yeah there were for, other people in the running. There was there was there was a lot of people that were in the running, and you know it it, it just wasn't done the traditional way that you would find a chief for a metro organization, mm -hmm. and you know they. Uh, they had to keep it on the down low because if they didn't, everybody, all the activists would come out and start screaming and yelling. Mm -hmm. And here's the unfortunate thing is, is that we don't have the people that truly are educated and squared away and, and ask those nice questions or good questions that you were talking about. What is a good leader? Do you do this? Do you do X, Y, do you do mm -hmm. Z? Do you, whatever it is that you do that you think is a good leader. They just bashed him. That's all mm -hmm. of them. That's all they would do. They would just go and vet them and they would find out every everything that they were accused of that was potentially negative and just fried them on it. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, come on, that's not, that's, that's the kind of person that I want to have input on who my chief is. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. You know, be constructive with your criticism, mm -hmm. but, but don't be malicious about it. And, and that's, that's what it was happening in Aurora is that all of this malicious nonsense was starting to occur. I mean, if you look at our city council meetings, my God, that's a circus. Yeah, it it's is. a circus. It is. You're right. And I'm like, why do you guys sit there on the dais and take this kind of crap? And why aren't you, we're trying to go arrest people for that, right? There, mm -hmm. There's this thought process that you can't arrest somebody for trespassing in a public building. I would strongly encourage you to read the statutes a little bit closer mm -hmm. because you 100% can do that. Yeah. Well, you know what it is. It's, it's politics. These are these politics. They're elected right. officials. But then, but then what happens? They, 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 you know, they, they, they think it looks bad it does, if they but, arrest somebody who came in and criticized But then them. what happens, right? Who you know. who gets the brunt of that? The yeah. police officers get the brunt of that. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. It's yeah. not about the politicians. It's not about anything else. It's about the cops. Well, but there's ways to run public meetings and, and, and council meetings um, to where you can limit that kind of disruption. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's up to it's up to each community to decide how they do it, but but I've seen it in some places where it's just it's a pretty tight ship, and people get to go and express themselves, and they get to say bad things about the people that got elected, um, but they don't get to be disruptive, and they right. don't and they don't get to and they don't get to go on ad nauseum because right. there's a, there's they have other venues for for where that happens, and it's not the it's not the business meeting of the city, which is what a city council meeting is. So, I mean, it's just it's just a matter of, I think, engaging with community people and saying, hey, this is the way we're going to do business and we want to hear from you. But we got business to do and we're going to get the business done. Um, so anyway, um, but I thought that was interesting, you know, that they that they raised that issue. And I, I was just curious about what, the, you know, how you guys felt about how the process went. Sounds like you didn't really have a problem with the, the cops didn't. They just wanted a leader. Yeah. They wanted somebody in the position. And it sounded like the from the, the consent decree monitor wanted one too. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think you're right. You know, I think so, you're right. Um, 
if there was something you could change about the, the situation of the consent decree in Aurora, what would it be? The consent decree? Yeah. Um, I would, I would change about the consent decree. I would, it's difficult to say that not allowing the media to have this understanding, right? I, I would have liked it to be treated like sensitive information mm-hmm. of what they give out, right? I would like, okay, the AG's office is in there and we do stakeholder meetings every, I think it's every month that we do that. Is it? I think so. I'm there. I know mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um, and the AG's office is there and all the stakeholders are there. Fire department, Chief Otten's there, Chief Chamberlain's there, all the other chiefs are there. But I wish that we didn't have to then say, okay, media, here, Take this, take all this report because they spin that yeah. and they spin it to say that, oh, but Aurora's not fully, they, they're not meeting the requirement to its best right here. Mm-hmm. And they're not me, but they don't say anything about, and I appreciate you saying that we've gotten 78% of it all completed, right? Yeah. That doesn't even come up. Yeah. So I would like And that's that. in the report. Yes. That's where right. I got it from. Right, right. Okay. And what I would like is that to be treated like sensitive information. Mm-hmm. And that only goes out to select individuals. Yeah. Because all you do is, is create more consternation, right? And then everybody starts getting all bent out of shape about it. And then it creates more problems. It really, that's the only thing that I think I would change. Although there's a part of me that I, I really do. I was very open arms to integra sure when they came in Mm -hmm. whatever you guys can do to assist us with getting better on i'm all for it because i do believe that even the city of aurora they still including city management and the elected officials still want it to be fletcher colorado Mm -hmm. and it's just not yeah it's just not yeah so we have to evolve and Mm -hmm. that was a downfall the aurora police department had is that we didn't evolve with times we just kept this reputation of being one of the best police departments, arguably the best police department in the state. Mm -hmm. And they just stayed the same instead of evolving with time. And you can't stay Fletcher, Colorado forever. So that's the only thing that I would have changed is just get that, make it sensitive so that not everybody's out there with their ability to put a spin on it. So you guys were the first ones to deal with this. Um, And from an FOP Lodge leader perspective, is there any advice you would give to other FOP leaders if they found themselves in the same situation? Is there anything you'd want them to know about it? Check your ego at the door and have an open mind. And because that's a good leader, right? Okay. I would, I would strongly encourage any other leader in the FOP that when somebody comes in, and especially at this, at this level, if they come in and say, we're just here to make you better, don't take it so personal. Be a leader. That's why you got elected by your membership was to be a leader. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not doing the best. I have to do something better and, and take that for what it's worth. Don't take it personal. It's somebody trying to be helpful to you. Right. And just check your ego at the door and listen to other perspectives. You can have spirited conversations with them behind closed doors, but have it constructive. Don't come in there flexing your muscles and banging your fist and, and trying to be this real big, tough guy. Cause it's, it's, you're not going to get anything accomplished. Yeah. So check your ego at the door and listen to what they have to say. Anything else that you'd like to talk about that we didn't talk about or anything else you'd like to cover that about some of the topics we, we talked about or anything? I don't think so. I think, like I said, just, just give this time and, and really think about opinions that you're coming up with that they're educated and recognize what the media does and how they spin it. And I would, I would encourage people to one day just watch the media (laughs) and, and turn the volume down and tell me what you actually just witnessed by videos that you're shown. Yeah. That's it. Great. Well, Mark, thanks again for joining us on Colorado Protectors. Thank you. I really appreciated you taking the time. I thought it was a great discussion. Um, And uh, I learned a lot. And I think, uh, you know, our members and the public, if they watch this, uh, will learn a lot too. So Appreciate you. Uh, just want to give one more plug. Colorado Police Officers Foundation. Go to coloradopolicefoundation.org. Uh, look at the work they're doing and make a donation. Thanks. Thank you.